Hi everybody. I hope this video finds everybody doing well and in good spirits. And before I get into the thrust of this video, I just want to acknowledge a uh, couple things that I watched on YouTube um, from ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, the first one I want to acknowledge is XJW Philippines. If you haven't um, found her channel yet, you can just type in XJW Philippines and her videos will come up. And one of her latest videos, um, well, at least it came up in my recommended list, so I would refer it as to one of her latest, but I don't recall exactly how old the video is. But she's looking for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in the Philippines. Um, she would like to get a, a group together so that they could, you know, share experiences, get to know one another as ex-members. So if you can go to her channel, introduce yourself, especially if you are an ex-Jehovah Witness from the uh, Philippines, uh, I'm sure she would greatly appreciate that. I also want to acknowledge a comment that I watched just this morning off of the Vinnie Vincent channel. This was his latest um, that he put up. And Vinnie, my friend, I don't know if you recognized the amount of dialogue you opened up with your last statement about the shepherd will always lead the sheep to the slaughter. <laughs> because you're right. That's the ultimate goal of any shepherd is to lead the flock to the slaughter. Now just think about it, Vinny. Just think about it. You, you have this flock of sheep. Now, granted, some of the sheep are going to be used for the wool. Some of the sheep are going to be used for, you know, breeding purposes. And some of the sheep, well, when the usefulness is complete, when that shepherd can get every bit of monetary value out of that sheep, it will be slaughtered. See, one of the reasons why a shepherd protects the sheep from the enemy, the wolf, is so that the shepherd can get the most value out of that sheep before he takes it to the slaughter. But ultimately, ultimately, the shepherd, no matter how good the shepherd is, will ultimately always lead the sheep to the slaughter. And that's exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses do. See, do you trust the faithful slave? Do you trust the shepherds in your congregations? You know, the elders are your shepherds. Vinny, thank you so much for that comment because it just opened up another whole, another whole picture frame, another whole window to look at this whole Christian thing and the facade of sheep. Because a shepherd, and you're right, a shepherd will always lead the sheep to the slaughter once they're finished with it. And that's why Watchtower has no problems throwing people away. Because they know that they're done with them. Because their value as a door-to-door -door preacher is gone. Their value as a valued member in the congregation is done. And their value in their pocketbook is done. They'll throw you away. They don't care if you die or not. They don't care. Because your value is no good. And that's what a shepherd ultimately does. So thank you, Vinny. Okay. Now I want to elaborate a little bit on a series of videos that ex-JW Alda's wife Jane Doe is doing and it's um, entitled <laughs> Russian Roulette. Jehovah's Witnesses are playing Russian Roulette. The thing you have to recognize about that game Russian uh, Roulette, no matter how many times you take and spin that cylinder, you always, always, always have a one in six chance that that bullet is gonna fire and go off. And 
those are not very good odds. Those are actually very bad odds. Now what Jehovah's Witnesses don't recognize ultimately is that when they're playing that game of Russian uh, roulette, Watchtower never really put a bullet in that chamber. We all know that Jehovah's Witnesses are willing to die because of what's written in the pages of the Holy Word of God. We all know they're willing to die. Every ex-member at one time or another, I guarantee you contemplate, oh my God, what if I get in an accident tomorrow and I, and I need life-saving blood? Well, well, the Bible says to be obedient to Jehovah, I have to die. It's like spinning that cylinder and nothing happens. But on the day, on the day that you do end up in a hospital and you have to make that life changing decision whether it be for you yourself one of your children or even a family member and in a lot of cases the hospital liaison you have to recognize that there's really nothing in that gun there's there's it's it's empty words now you jehovah's witnesses are very familiar with the bible passage that says train your perceptive powers to distinguish between right and wrong that's what you have to do when you're reading the Bible. But you don't read the Bible. You don't read it to learn anything. You just read it to pacify the Watchtower organization. You read it to pacify the elders so that you can, you know, raise some, uh, raise your hand and give some sort of intelligent com comment during one of your meetings. But you don't really sit down and process what you're reading. It, you're, it, it's easier for you to process what you read in a Watchtower magazine or in a Wake magazine than, it, than you do the Bible. Recently, Kim and I was on an episode um, with The Glass Table. It was a live podcast and it was very, very enjoyable. And I had made a comment during that podcast about a waking up moment. Now, if you go to our channel, Kim Mikey, you will see that um, those gals took that little short snippet of me saying that, um, you know, that was the aha moment. And even Kim and I uh, turned at each other at that same time and said, you know, we're going to get disfellowshipped over this. And it had to do with the cross. And since then, Kim has gotten a couple of emails from some of you friends wanting the information or where you could get that information regarding the cross. And this is why I say Watchtower has an empty gun. They've got nothing to threaten you with. That's all it is. It's just empty words of threat. If you're a current Jehovah's Witness, I want to show you what woke my wife and I up. Because what Watchtower did regarding the cross is they manufactured a lie. And I'm going to show you this. When I was a young man, I asked my mother one time, after reading some of Watchtower literature, I noticed that what Watchtower was doing, when they was quoting a source, they would put a dot, dot, dot. Now, I didn't know what the dot, dot, dot was, and it's what they call an ellipsis. So I asked my mother what that dot, dot, dot meant, and what her response to me was something that I have never ever forgotten my entire life. What my mother said was, well that's something in the paragraph that Watchtower leaves out because it doesn't validate their point. It has nothing to do with Watchtower's point, the point that they're making. Which very well could be unless you're using it to not let your reading audience see the full paragraph because when you read the full paragraph you see that it has everything to do with manufacturing a lie and that's why they want to leave that portion out so what I want you friends to do if you still have one your reasoning from the scriptures page 89 under the cross the definition reads this, the device in which Jesus Christ was executed is referred to by most of Christendom as a cross. The expression is drawn from the Latin crux, 
Okay? So, Watchtower goes on and asks the question, why do Watchtower publications show Jesus on a stake with hands over his head instead of on the traditional cross? This is their explanation. The Greek word rendered cross in many modern Bible versions, in parentheses, torture stake in the New World, is steros. In classical Greek, there's the qualifier, in classical Greek. This word meant merely an upright stake or pail. Later, it also came to be used for an execution stake having a cross piece. The Imperial Bible Dictionary acknowledges saying, the Greek word for cross, steros, properly signifies a stake, an upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used in implementing fencing in a piece of ground. Dot, dot, dot. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appears to have uh, been originally an upright pole. Now right there, Watchtower puts a period, letting its reader think that's the end of the source they're quoting from. So when Kim and I were shown this paragraph from the reasoning book, the friend that we were talking with asked us if we knew what the dot 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 was. What portion Watchtower left out of that paragraph? Because when you read the whole thing in context, it says something much, much different. So, Kim and I went to openlibrary.org and we downloaded that particular page from the Imperial Bible Dictionary. And when we filled in the dot, 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 and when we read beyond the period that Watchtower puts here, instead of the comma that's in the Imperial Bible Dictionary, I knew right there and then that the Watchtown Bible Tract Society manufactured a lie. And the reason being, because somebody at Watchtower had to sit down and read from the Imperial Bible Dictionary that paragraph over and over and over and over again to know exactly where to put the ellipsis and to know exactly where to put the period. Change the comma to a period. That takes a conscious effort to do. That is a manufactured lie. And if you Jehovah's Witnesses can see this and still believe that Jehovah is blessing your organization even though they have a manufactured lie, then you have more problems than anybody could ever help you with. Because you have not trained your perceptive powers to distinguish between right and wrong. Now, Kim and I began to search for a hard copy of the Imperial, Imperial Bible Dictionary. We even want, went on to eBay and we came about that close of spending $300 on a hard copy. We didn't. And thanks to XJW Elder's wife, Jane Doe, she was able to find a copy for us and sent us the copy. Thank you so much, Jane Doe, because this gift proves to be invaluable. Now what I'm going to do, friends, is I'm going to read right from the Imperial Bible Dictionary what it says about the cross. Now what I want you to do, friends, is I want you to pick up your reasoning book and follow along. And you'll see exactly where Watchtower manufactured the lie. 
And before I go any further, I want you current Jehovah's Witnesses to stop and ponder because I used to do the same thing when I went from door to door and somebody challenged the cross versus the stake. I would say, yes, it's true. The Romans did execute people on crosses when they were destroying Jerusalem in 70 CE, but not in Jesus' day. You're only talking about a, a 40 year difference. Jesus was supposedly crucified in 33 CE, and by the time 70 CE, the, the, the Romans, you know, changed from crucifying, punishing people on a stake, and then going to a cross. It doesn't make sense because you're only talking about, you know, less than a 40 year period. 40 years, it's not even a generation. You can't even forget something that you learned 40 years ago. Just like me and my mother's statement about the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. Well, that has nothing to do with the point that Watchtower is trying to make. So they don't put it in, you know, they didn't put it in their literature. You don't forget something like that in a 40 year span. So I'm going to read, follow along. The Greek word for cross, steros, properly signifies a stake. An upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used for impaling a piece of ground. But a modification was introduced as the dominion and usages of Rome extended themselves through Greek speaking countries. As the dominion, that means as Rome was reaching out. Not, you know, from 33 CE up to 70 CE, you're talking a greater span of time that the Romans were punishing criminals on crosses. See, now let me read that again because this is the dot, dot, dot. This is what Watchtower doesn't want you to recognize. Now keep in mind, when Watchtower did this, getting your hands on an on a imperial Bible dictionary was a monumental task. You'd have to go to a huge library and hope to God they had this set of encyclopedias. And chances are they probably didn't. So Watchtower was playing Russian roulette with themselves. Only, only they put a bullet in that gun for real. Because in time, we can all get our hands on this, even if it's through openlibrary.org. You see, Jehovah's Witnesses, what they're wanting you to do by sacrificing your, uh, your life, by playing Russian roulette, their gun towards you is not loaded, but they themselves have loaded the gun and they turned it on themselves. Okay, so I'm going to reread what Watchtower leaves out, the ellipsis. But a modification was introduced as the dominion and usages of Rome extended themselves through Greek speaking countries. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appears to have been originally an upright pole and this was always remained the more important part. The more important part signifies there's more pieces to the cross or more importantly, more pieces to the steros. But from the time that it began to be used as an instrument of punishment, a traverse piece of wood was commonly added. Not, however, always even then. For it would seem that there were more kinds of deaths than one by the cross. This being sometimes accomplished by transfixing the criminal with a pole which was run through his back and spine and came out at his mouth. Wow. 
You see how horrible it was to die on a cross? Going on, um, there's some Greek words here that I'm unable to pronounce. So I'm just going to skip those and read on where the parentheses um, uh, end. In another place, Seneca mentions three different forms. I see, says he, three crosses, not indeed of one sort, but fashioned in different ways. One sort suspended by the head persons bent toward the earth, others transfixing them through their secret parts, others extending their arms on a pet, uh, petabolum the cross piece. There can be no doubt, however, that the latter sort was the more common and that about the period of the gospel age. Crucifixion was usually accomplished by suspending the criminal on a cross piece of wood. Manufactured lie. You see, Watchtower, you're the ones that's actually playing Russian roulette. Because I've just read the entire paragraph from the Imperial Bible Dictionary regarding the cross. Like I said, friends, Watchtower had to sit down and consciously read that paragraph to know exactly where to put the ellipsis, to know exactly where to put the period, and to know exactly where not to continue reading the paragraph. That takes a conscious effort to do. Now, if you want to further validate something about the cross, I suggest you type in cross versus stake and search YouTube until you find the videos that was done by the leading New York pathologist, Dr. Frederick Zugaby. You will see his studies regarding the stake, the steros versus the cross and how putting a person on the cross extends their execution period to several, several hours. As opposed to somebody being hung on a steros with their hands above their head, you will see the trauma is more severe on the body with the hands above the head because the entire weight of the body shifts right here and most victims that are hung on a steros, a stake, die within about 10 minutes. If the Bible says Jesus hung for several hours, then he could not have hung on a steros. And that is modern day forensics validating what I just said. Study and research Jehovah's Witnesses, and every time you read one of their pieces of literature with a dot, 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 you can bet that they are consciously making an effort to lie. Now, going on a little bit more. When I did my video a couple of years ago entitled, Who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice, I didn't recognize how much mileage I could get out of that video. At that time though, there were many apologists, some of them ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, and some of them non-Jehovah's Witnesses trying to contend uh, with me over that video. And one of those non-Jehovah's Witness apologists made the statement to my wife on the phone that the reason why Jehovah was killing all of those people and killing all of those tribes is so that he could protect the bloodline that Jesus was going to come through. If you don't do your research, that statement by itself could stand, couldn't it? 
But when you do your research, you realize it falls flat on its face. And what I have come to learn since I had done that video, that whenever you get a Christian's apologist backed up into a corner, all sorts of things will fly out of their mouth that invalidates the Bible. It's not a difficult thing to do. Just get him in a corner, just like you do a Jehovah Witness, just like my wife did a few days ago when that Jehovah Witness called this house trying to do some telephone witnessing. Remember what my wife said in that video that that Jehovah Witness said? Well, I don't like the way this conversation is going. It's because Kim backed her into a corner and she had to leave. Some apologists will try to claw their way out of a corner and they don't recognize what they're doing. So, did Jehovah allow the Israelites to go through the promised land and kill everybody to protect the bloodline leading down to Jesus? <laughs> I want to read something from the book of Deuteronomy. And before I start reading this, I want to ask you Jehovah's Witnesses, in particular, because this is who these videos are geared to. Because even though the blood policy is absolutely an empty chamber in that game of Russian roulette that you're playing, you have to recognize something from the Bible. So, before I read from Deuteronomy, I want you Jehovah's Witnesses just to sit and think about everything you know about why Jehovah called for the execution and the extermination of the Moabites. I want you to stop and think because the Bible is littered with stories of the Israelites patting themselves on the back for wiping out the Moabites. Because you got to remember, some apologists will say, see, Jehovah allowed that so that he could protect the bloodline going down to Jesus, so that that bloodline could be pure. Stop and think about all those stories that you've read, you've told yourselves during those meetings in the Kingdom Hall, and you're, oh yeah, see, Jehovah's protecting his people. Jehovah's doing this, and Jehovah loves his people. And that's why they wiped out the Moabites. Now, if you listen to XJWL's wife, Jane Doe, and you listen to this channel a lot, you are going to hear that the Israelites worshiped multiple gods throughout their history. Their history is littered with the worshiping of different gods, and even the goddesses. It's littered. So when some apologist sits there and tries to convince you that, oh no, oh no, they worshiped only the one God, that's an absolute lie. That is not true. Because you can pick up the Bible yourself and read this. But I want to read something specifically about the Moabites. Because not only were the Israelites, the Hebrews, disobedient about worshiping only the one God, they were also disobedient and wiping out a specific nation. Genesis chapter 2. Then we turned and pulled away from the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, just as Jehovah had spoken to me. And we were many days in going around Mount uh, Seir. Finally, Jehovah said this to me. Now you can assume Moses is writing this. Finally, Jehovah said this to me. You have gone around this mountain long enough. Change your direction to the north. And command the people, saying, You are passing along by the border of your brothers, the sons of Esau. You remember Jacob and Esau? Their brothers. who is dwelling in Seir. And they will be afraid because of you. And you must be very careful 
Do not engage in strife with them because I shall not give you of their land so much as the width of the sole of the foot because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a holding. Hmm, Jacob and Esau. Seems to me like there was a selling off of a birthright. And yet now Jehovah is telling the Israelites not to harass the family line of Esau because they're their brothers. So while you continuously read Jehovah's Witnesses that Esau forsook his birthright, you have something in your own Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 2, that tells a much different story now. Going on, verse 6. What food you may buy from them for money, you must eat. They're in the wilderness. They're crying for manna. Well, Jehovah, Jehovah, we're done with manna. We want, but yet they're buying food from the family of Esau in the wilderness. Kind of contradicts that story, doesn't it? Jehovah's Witnesses. Verse 6, what food you may buy for them for money, you must eat. And also what water you may purchase from them for money, you must drink. What, weren't they lacking water in the wilderness? But now they get the money to buy water from the descendants of Esau. Verse 7, for Jehovah your God has blessed you in every deed of your hand. He well knows of your walking through this great wilderness, these 40 years. Jehovah your God has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. Yeah, it's because they're buying it from other merchants. <laughs> they're robbing and pillaging other little towns. Verse 8, So we passed on away from our brothers, the sons of Esau, who are dwelling in Seir, from the way of the Arabah, from Elah, and from Ezion Geber. Now notice if you're reading along, there is a paragraph, there's a new paragraph starting. It's not numbered, so you have a paragraph in a paragraph that's not numbered. So was this added in at a later date? Who knows? But I want to read how it starts the next paragraph. Next, we turned and passed on by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Jehovah then said to me, Do not molest Moab or engage in war with them, because I shall not give you any of his land as a holding. For to the sons of Lot, I have given R as a holding. Did the Israelites obey that mandate? No, they didn't because your Bible is littered with wars between Israel and the Moabites. But yet, a direct order from Jehovah, do not molest Moab or engage in war with them because I shall not give you any of his land as a holding. For to the sons of Lot, I have given R as a holding. Now, it's a very disturbing scripture when you look at the Israelites not only disobeying Jehovah and worshiping multiple, multiple gods, now they are disobeying Jehovah because they did molest, they did go to war with the Moabites. So, the Moabites in Scripture, depending on how you want to view it, become the enemy of the Israelites. Now, keep in mind, some apologists will say, see, Jehovah allowed that because they had to keep the bloodline going down to Jesus Christ, pure. Get your Bibles. Matthew. Chapter 1, I am going to start with verse 7, 
and work backwards up to, okay? So verse 7, Solomon became father to Rehoboam. Verse 6, the bottom half, David became father to Solomon, the wife of Uriah. Now we all know that Solomon, David, the starting of verse 6, Jesse became father to David the king. So now you have Solomon, King David, so Jesse is the grandfather of Solomon, right? Okay, we all get that. Who was Jesse's father? Obed became father to Jesse. Boaz became father to Obed by Ruth. Do you Jehovah's Witnesses remember who wrote Ruth is? She's a Moabite. She's a Moabite. The Moabite is Ruth. Go read the book of Ruth. You'll see that as plain as the nose on your face. And then uh, the beginning of verse 5, Rahab, uh, Salmon became father to Boaz by Rahab. You Jehovah's Witnesses know that Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute. According to the storyline, you know, she's the one that put the little red cord out the window so Jehovah would not destroy her and her family. And then she's placed in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So you have a Canaanite and you have a Moabite. That bloodline leading down to Jesus Christ is not pure. You have the Moabite and you have the Canaanite bloodline in the line of Jesus. You have Rahab and you have Ruth, the Moabite. Now when you write this out, when you take a moment to write this lineage out, don't just read it. Get your pen and paper and figure it out. See? David's father was Jesse. David's grandfather was Obed and his grandmother was Ruth the Moabite. So that bloodline leading down to Jesus is not a pure bloodline and it takes away the excuse that Christians use as to why Jehovah allowed and commanded the Israelites to kill everybody, kill them all. I'll sort them out later. Now, one last thing. Jehovah's Witnesses, you really, really, really need to sit down and read Ezekiel chapter 16. It is an eye-opener. Starting with verse 1. And the word of Jehovah came further to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her detestable things. Now you have to keep in mind, Jehovah's Witnesses, when you read this, he's not talking about the city. He's talking about the people inside the city. He's not talking about the city, the four walls of the walls that, that surround Jerusalem. He's talking about the inhabitants, the people. Verse 3, and you must say, this is what the sovereign Lord Jehovah has said to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth were from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. I hope that you're going to read on. But I want you to stop, take a breath, when you get to verse 44. And when you get to 44, I want you to stop. And I want you to think about everything you know as to the reason why Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, well, easy. It was full of immorality. He had to kill all them gay people. He had to kill all them homosexuals. Because after all, you know, when the angels appeared, the men in the city with the little boys were cr uh, crying for Lot to send out the men so they could have relations with them. It's a despicable thing, and that's why Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, verse 44, chapter 16 of Ezekiel. Look, everyone using a proverb against you 
will use the proverb saying, like mother, like her daughter. <laughs> oh, Babylon the Great. These words you can find in the book of Revelation. Babylon the Great and her daughters. So really, is the book of Revelation a future prophecy about the world? You know, the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one, or is the book of Revelation now being made more specific to Jerusalem? If you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll see. Going on, you are the daughter of your mother, one abhorring her husband and her sons. And you are the sister of your sisters who abhor their husbands and their sons. The mother of you woman was a Hittite, and your father was an Amorite. Now, didn't I just read that? In verse 3, your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite, and your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. Ezekiel repeats the words right here later in verse 45. Now verse 46. Pay attention. And your older sister is Samaria herself, with her dependent towns, who are dwelling on your left, and your sister, younger than you, who is dwelling on your right, is Sodom with her dependent towns. Oh, so now Ezekiel is going to compare Sodom and Gomorrah and the, you know, dependent towns to Jerusalem. But listen and pay attention to what the scripture says because it is going to contradict what you read about Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. Verse 47, And it was not in their ways that you walked, nor according to their detestable things that you did. In a very little while, you even began to act more ruinously than they did in all your ways. So then that would mean that Jerusalem, if you're going to believe the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the reason why Jehovah destroyed them because of homosexuality, and Ezekiel is saying you were worse than that, then that means that the immorality in Jerusalem was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 48. As I am alive, is the utterance of the Sovereign Lord Jehovah, Sodom, your sister, she with her dependent towns, has not done according to what you did, you and your dependent towns. Look, this is what proved to be the error of Sodom, your sister, pride. Sufficiency of bread. In other words, wealth. And their carefreeness of keeping undisturbed where what happened to belong to her and her dependent towns. In the hand of the afflicted one and the poor, she did not strengthen. And they continued to be haughty and to carry on a detestable thing before me. And I finally removed them, just as I saw fit. Reread verse 49. Look, this is what proved to be the error of Sodom and her sister. Those passages don't even give an inclination of homosexuality. Doesn't even refer to Lot, does it? But what you Jehovah's Witnesses have to recognize is what right here that Ezekiel is writing comes from an apocrypha, a great rejected text, because it's not inspired of God. So if the text, and Kim and I did a video on this, we showed you friends specifically from the apocrypha why Sodom and Gomorrah 
was destroyed. It's because of her pride, because of her haughtiness, because she did not take care of the older people. They were left to starve to death on the city streets. And one of Lot's daughters took in a dying, starving person and nursed him back to health, and then she was executed. See, that is in one of the Apocryphas, and maybe Kim can put the link to that Apocrypha right here because I don't recall what it was. Maybe it's the book of Jubilees. I don't recall specifically. But if these Christian apologists are going to say, well, that is a missing book from the Bible, it's not inspired of God, then what in the hell is Ezekiel quoting from that for that you do now believe is the inspired word of God? I rest my case. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed not because of homosexuality, because of pride, sufficiency of bread, and the carefreeness of keeping undisturbed where what happened to belong to her and her dependent towns, and the hand of the afflicted one and the poor one she did not strengthen. It's exactly what we read out of one of those apocryphas. So if those apocryphas are not inspired in their forgeries, then Ezekiel, by extension, is quoting from a forgery. Because the account of Sodom and Gomorrah happened and is placed in the book of Genesis. The account of Ezekiel is thousands and thousands of years later in the timeline. Okay, friends, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope that you can learn Jehovah's Witnesses. Learn something from this. That when it comes to your religion, the Jehovah's Witnesses, JW.org, Washtown Bible Crap Society, they are letting you use a gun to play Russian roulette that truly does not have a bullet in it. You can spin it all you want, all you want, and you have a 100% chance that that gun is not going to go off. But what I just showed you, friends, is the Washington Bible Track Society, they're the ones that are playing Russian roulette with a loaded firearm. Thanks for watching. Bye.